I'm white, I'm black, I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm American, I'm male, I'm female, I'm a southerner, I'm a midwesterner, I'm lower class, I'm middle class, I'm upper class, I'm white collar, I'm blue collar. These are just a few ways that people today identify themselves. In the world we look around, there's all kinds of ways that people say, this is my identity. This is who I am. And throughout human history, people have liked to sort of divide into groups and categorizations. And, and one of the most common ways that people do that is to, to look at... Uh, uh, the amount uh, the, of clothes uh, that you have in your closet, the clothes you're wearing on your back, the, the money in your bank account, the house in which you live, the car in your driveway. But I want you to know that God does not define you as the government defines you. The government defines you by your adjusted gross income or your tax bracket. We look at other ways of identifying people and, and, and we kind of think of what worth is, not necessarily only in terms of a financial, financial gain, but, but, but people look at it and they think, okay, well, well, what's the color of your skin? What, how many degrees do you have hanging on your wall? Sometimes people look and say, well, how many friends and followers do you have on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Snapchat or TikTok? whatever it might be, that you kind of use that to measure your worth. But I want you to understand that you are not defined by who other people think you are, but by who God says you are. Not by what other people think you are, but by what God says you are. Now, I want you to listen to James chapter 1, James chapter 1 and verse 9. And the Bible tells us, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. For as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, as we think about this verse, let me make it very, very simple. James is telling us that if you are poor, but you are a believer, that you are not a second-class citizen. Likewise, he's telling us that if you are a wealthy person, do not think too highly of yourself because you're wealthy. And as we think of what he's telling us, every believer, whether rich or poor, has to evaluate his or her present status in the light of eternity. Now, I realize that this isn't only true of finances. What I'm going to say this morning is a lot of talk about finances and your financial status, but it's not just true about finances. He's telling us also that if you are tempted and you're tried in this life, then look beyond the temptations, look beyond the trials that you're facing to your future triumph. Now, last week we talked about unwavering faith, and we talked about how we, uh, we, we pray for wisdom in the midst of trials with an, and have an unwavering faith. And, and you may ask, what on earth this has to do with a call to unwavering faith? But as I think about how people deal with poverty and how people deal with plenty, it, it's clear that when some people, when they deal with, uh, uh, with poverty, that uh, they, they falter in their faith. They, they, they really uh, begin to say, well, God, how's he get, how am I going to pay my next bill? And their faith begins to falter. Now, other people who have plenty, you know what they do? They don't falter in their faith. They forget their faith altogether. And so all of this reminds us that we have to remember who we are in Christ. Listen, your identity is not FDIC insured. Your identity is eternally secure. 
And so as we think about what he says here, uh, James has us look at three groups, three groups, and, and, and how their status relates to the future. Now, he tells us here, first of all, we're going to think about how what he says about the poor, and he tells us the hope of the poor, the humility of the prosperous, and the honor of the pressure. Now, first, let's look at the hope of the poor believer. In verse 9, James mentions the lowly brother. And as he does, he's talking about somebody who is low in socioeconomic status. He's not talking about their height. He's not talking about their outlook. He's talking about someone who has a uh, low socioeconomic status. He's talking about a poor person. But he's not just talking about any poor person. He says the lowly brother. That word brother there means this is a person who has given Jesus Christ their heart and their life. They have committed their sins to him to be forgiven, and they are born again. And so this, this brother uh, is, is uh, a person who is a poor believer. And if you want to think back about the book of James and you want to understand the context of this book, many of James' first readers were very, very poor. In fact, uh, we know that in the mid-first uh, century A.D. that there was a great famine in Judea. And during this famine, uh, there was a great shortage of food and jobs and, and things were very difficult. In fact, Paul went around the, the ancient world collecting an offering for these poor Judean believers. But not only were they poor, but they were also persecuted. Well, we know from reading in uh, the book of James, he says in verse 1 or, or verse 2, he talks about the, the 12, in verse 1, the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And, and that reminds us that because of persecution, they had spread out. And as they went to new cities, they found that their faith in Jesus made it difficult to get a decent job. And not only were they, many of them uh, persecuted, and not only uh, were they ex experiencing this famine, uh, and not only did they have difficulty finding work, but, but many early Christians were actually slaves. And the only hope they had was not in this life, it was in the next. It was in Christ. Now, as I think about today, I realize that, that uh, the situation is not as dire here in America, e even in spite of the runaway inflation that seems like there's happening around us and the uh, economy that we're facing. Uh, the, the situation is not nearly as dire as it was for these early believers. But I also know this, that there are many Christians here in America today who are poor. And some of you have dealt with poverty and are dealing with poverty. Uh, I know that uh, Laura's grandpa, he used to say he was born in the midst of the Great Depression, he used to say that when I was a kid, we were so poor we couldn't afford a mother. And I'm not sure exactly what that meant, but uh, I'm reminded of what another man said. He said, when I was a kid growing up in the Depression, he said, uh, I said, we had three meals a day. We had oatmeal for breakfast, we had cornmeal for dinner, and we had no meal for supper. But uh, some of you can relate to poverty. But and we think about poverty and how, it, how we deal with poverty in the midst of temptations and trials, what he's saying here isn't unrelated to everything we've looked at before. Because poverty is a great temptation and trial. When, when you're poor, it's easy to be tested. And, and to, to, it's difficult to maintain the right perspective about yourself and about your situation. It's hard to remember what James tells us to rejoice when you fall into poverty. It is difficult to count it all joy in those situations. It is difficult to understand who you are in Christ in spite of your poverty. It's hard to keep trusting God when you don't know how both ends are going to meet. It's hard to be like the widow of Zarephath and the Philippian believers and show generosity even out of rock bottom poverty. It's hard to praise God for what you do have when you look around and can think about all the things that you don't have. And, and, and when only think about, in addition to all those things, when you are poor, it's easy to develop a low view of yourself. I mean, he says the lowly brother. Many people view you as lower than they are because of your socioeconomic situation. And, and sometimes not only can you, uh, other people will view you lowly, but then you also begin to have a low view of yourself. When I graduated from college, Laura and I, we got married right after graduation, and we moved to Louisville, Kentucky. And I was working, uh, going to seminary, going, working in a fast food restaurant and at UPS. And uh, I'll just tell you this, when you work in a fast food restaurant, and when see people see you with a mop in your hand, very quickly you learn what 
Rodney Dangerfield meant when he said, I get no respect. I got no respect. People thought that I was lower than them, and after a while, I began to think I was lower than they were too because of the way I was treated. And, and, and you begin to see that in life. And it's easy to have that kind of perspective about yourself when you are poor. But James says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. You know what that word glory means? He's commanding us here to brag, but not brag in an ostentatious kind of way, in an arrogant kind of way. He's telling us to rejoice because our present state as poor people is only temporary. To rejoice in our exaltation because the groanings of earth, he's telling us, are going to give way to the glory of heaven. The, the poverty that you experience here is going to give, in this life, is going to give way amidst the pageantry of the next. The humiliation you're facing now is going to be uh, evaporated in light of the exaltation we're going to have in the next. And think about your present status. There's a reason to rejoice in the present, not just in the future, because of your present status. In the book of in James chapter 2, verse 5, remember he says this, But let, listen, my beloved brother, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he's promised to those who love him? 1 Peter chapter 2, one of my very favorite verses is verse 9 there where he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who you are right now. If you're a poor person, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. That's the word of Jesus about who you are. You're a child of the king. That's one of my favorite songs. You remember that? If we had some keys up here. I'd, I'd sing it for you. A tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace from me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still may I sing all glory to God. I'm a child of the king. We know where we're going to be in the future. Jesus said, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And, and while you may have a humble status before men, Rejoice in your exalted status before God. Realize you are defined by who you are in the Lord Jesus. You can be a rich, poor person. But listen, if you are a rich person financially, but you don't know Jesus, you're just a poor, rich person. But Jesus shows us not only the hope of the poor, he goes on and he shows us here as well the humility of the prosperous, so the, the humility that a prosperous believer should have. The Bible says, but the rich in his humiliation. Now, it is difficult to maintain hope when you're poor. When you don't have financial means, it's difficult to continue to trust God. And poverty is a test. It's a temptation. It's a trial. Now, I'm going to say something here that's going to make some of you say, David, I don't agree with that. But, but I would tell you that as great of a trial and as great of a temptation as poverty is, that prosperity is a greater trial and a greater temptation. You say, well, David, how can you even begin to say that prosperity is harder than poverty? Let me explain it very clearly. I'm not saying that uh, prosperity is, makes it harder to live. In fact, it makes it easier to live. It, it, is, it, it is harder to live when you're poor than when you're prosperous. But when you're prosperous, it's harder to live for God. That's the thing. A lot of people, they just forget God. When, you, when they're poor, uh, they may look to God and be dependent upon God. But when God begins to bless them, so many people forget God. You know, I think most people probably have, uh, you know, can handle anything. Some people can handle anything except success. And money can be incredibly deceptive. 
I read about a newspaper which once offered a prize for the best definition of money. And the award went to this definition. I want you to listen here. Money is an article in which, which may be used as a universal passport to everywhere except heaven and a universal provider of everything except happiness. Isn't that good? Money is, is a universal passport that will get you everywhere except heaven and provide everything except happiness. As you think about your own bank account today, as you think about your own financial situation, the hard truth is probably most of us have about all that God can trust us with. You remember the rich young man who came to Jesus wanting to know how he could have eternal life? Remember that Jesus said, come and take up your cross and follow me. But the Bible says he was sad at his word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The Bible has somewhat of a negative slant toward wealth. Now, I didn't say that the Bible ever says it's a sin to have money or to be wealthy, but, but it has a negative slant towards wealth. And the reason is not because it is a sin for you to have money, but it is a sin for your money to have you. And, and we have to be so careful about this, and this is all too common, and, and there's a lot of reasons why why, why, the, why the wealthy and for the, why the rich are, are often sort of, uh, you know, warned so often in Scripture. Because many people who are wealthy are more prone to pride, and they're more prone to selfishness, and they're more prone to exploit and abuse others with that money. And, and, and then when James says, but the rich, some people have tried to say here that he's talking about an unbelieving rich person. But I think in the context of James and what he's saying here in this passage and, and comparing it with what he said about the poor person, he has to be speaking about a rich believer. And what does he say? He says, let the rich, the verb is missing in, in my translation. I'm using the New King James, but it's supplied. He, he's saying the rich should glory like the poor person gloried, but not in his, exa his exaltation, but in his humiliation. Isn't that a strange thing to say? To glory in your humiliation, to rejoice in your humiliation. It doesn't mean that uh, you're going to be humiliated, that someone's going to uh, publicly roast you. But when he says that you should glory in your humiliation, what he's telling us is that this is the nature of the entire Christian life, that we live in paradox. As believers, when I say paradox, what I mean is that what the world sees as valuable is inverted and turned upside down, and that is our reality. What the world sees is not what God sees. The person who sees their prominence should instead humble themselves. Paradox means the re the, seeing the opposite of what the world sees. And R.G. Lee, great pastor, he was once president of Southern Baptist Convention, pastor of uh, Bellevue Baptist in Memphis. He once said this. He described Jesus' teaching like this. Christ stands among all teachers as a great palm in a desert of mediocrity. Teaching in paradoxes, super, superlatively supreme he is. You must lose life to find life. Hold on by letting go. Win life by losing it. Multiply by dividing. Be wise by being foolish. Increase by diminishing. Live by dying. Listen, friends, the way up is down. To be first, you've got to be last. And that means while the world looks at you and says, okay, you get first place, you get prominence, you get position because you're wealthy, instead you humble yourself and live with humility. As the Lord says in Jeremiah chapter 9, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this that he understands and knows me. That's, that's where the source of all boasting, not in person, not in position, not in possessions, but in the presence of God. And there's another reason to be humble. He says in verse 10, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. 
Because as a flower of the field, he's going to pass away. All the things that you look for in life, all the things that people think make a person great, houses and cars and clothes, are just temporary. Here today, gone tomorrow, fragile as a flower. The psalmist says it like this, Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. We all know that you've never seen a hearse with a luggage rack. We all know that you can't take it with you. Jesus said, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. A wealthy man died, and at the funeral, one man asked another, how much money did he leave behind? Another man wisely said, he left it all. Money always talks. It says goodbye. What matters is who we are and what we have, not in this life, but eternally. I read about a general who sat at a table in a royal court. And as he was sitting there at the king's table, beside him was the court chaplain. And over the course of the meal, trying to make conversation, the general turned to the chaplain and said, Pastor, Tell me something about heaven. Pastor looked at him a moment and thought, after speaking, uh, thinking a moment, he said, General, the first thing you need to know about heaven is that in heaven you won't be a general. We need to realize that life is fleeting, it's transitory, that our status here is not something that will go with us for eternity. And therefore, we need to be humble. Humble before God and to use our wealth, to use our resources as God would have us. And remember this, you're not better that you're not better than anyone else. I never forget a man who came to church one time, and every time I saw him, he would find a way to tell me how much money he had, how big his house was, who he had played golf with that week what successes and accomplishments he had made. You know, and, I, and I tried to be polite. You know, I just tried to just kind of smile. I was rolling my eyes. But, you know, I tried to be nice about it, not let him see that. But one day he asked me to get together, and uh, we were sharing a meal together, and he, he, he started on his regular routine, soapbox. And he finally said, uh, he said a lot of things, but uh, he finally said, you know, I, I really don't think I can come to your church I'm just not sure if I want to come to your church or not because you know as I look around he said I'm just so much wealthier than everybody he said I, I really just don't know if there's anybody there I can relate to because I've just got so much money I probably well I, I, I didn't say anything I, sh I shouldn't say in church but I shouldn't say it from the pulpit I, but, I, but I, I just get I, I had had enough and I gave that man a piece of my mind he grabbed the bell and slammed his fist on the table said, I want you to apologize to me. I said, well, you first. I've never seen him again since. But listen, how shameful that anybody could be so conceited and so arrogant who names the name of Christ to think I am better than my brothers and sisters in Jesus. God says the one who has plenty must be humble. And there's the hope of the poor, there's the humility of the prosperous, and there's the honor of the pressured. Notice there in verse 12, he says, he tells us that uh, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised those who trust him. Now, it's interesting that he says this here because back in verses 3 and 4, he talked about as you go through trials, that the value of going through trials on earth is that you will experience patience and maturity, which he calls perfection. You have this patience and, and uh, perfection here on earth, and that's one of the reasons you should continue to face trials. But now he moves it and he says, now it's not just about patience and uh, perfection. He says, now it's a prize for eternity. And he speaks about this, and when he says blessed, this means that there's a measurable obtainable blessing or benefit that comes from the, for the one who endures temptation. 
If you're poor, you'll receive a crown. If you are wealthy and you continue following Christ, you'll win a crown. If you face pressure and you continue to follow Christ, you'll wear a crown. And he just uses these things to, to give us the assurance that there is something that we have to hope for. Blessed it means there is, again, a measurable, clear indication of reward. This isn't just kind of a status, oh, you're blessed. You know, this is, this is an actual reward that comes to those who endure temptation. Now, to endure temptation here is generic. Previously, he's talked about the test of poverty. He's talked about the test of plenty or prosperity. But now he says it's just about the pressure that you face. And that pressure might be financial. It might be a pressure that comes from lust. It might be a temptation to cheat, to lie, to steal, to commit an immorality, to lose faith in Christ because of sorrow or because of sickness. It doesn't matter. Any kind of pressure is what he's talking about here. And you realize that every one of you in here today, you know what the pressure is in your life. But what he's telling you is to keep on keeping on for Jesus. And that is the proof that you are who you claim that you are. And that's what he means when he says when he's been approved. Blessed is man who endures temptation for when he has been approved. Now you say, well, what does it mean to be approved? Does that mean I've got to be perfect? He, when he says approved here, he, he, he's not talking about that you are faultless in relationship to sin. None of us are. He's saying that you have to be faithful in relationship to the Savior, that you just keep your eyes on Jesus, that you keep on living for him and moving for him. And what does he say? He says, you will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. He doesn't say you might win the crown of life. He doesn't say you could wear it, win the crown of life. He doesn't say you'll be entered into a drawing to win the crown of life. He says you will receive the crown of life. We need to remember that as a promise that we can take to the bank. Often, you know, when we're tempted and we're tested, we don't keep our focus on the future. I'm reminded of Joseph. When he was tempted, when he was tested there by Potiphar's wife, he, he could have chosen to give in to sin. And it would have resulted in both pleasure and keeping his position in the house. But rather, he continued to follow God. And if he had done those things, if he had given in, he would have never risen to power. And he could have never saved Egypt and the entire region of the world, which he did. And if they had never done that, then his entire family, the ones that had sold him into slavery, but to whom the promises and the plan of God had been given, they would have died, and those promises would have died with them. Because he was faithful, he won the crown of life. He received this prominence that comes from God. Lewis Evans says, one never sees the full picture of God until he takes the future into account. You might not understand why you should be faithful when facing pressure. You might not understand why you should be, have faith when you're facing poverty. You, you might not understand why you should have humility when you're, when you're prosperous. But don't take your focus off of the future when you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us will appear before his throne. And if you're found in Christ, you'll receive the crown of life, guaranteed. The crown which is life, this means eternal life. And it's described as a crown because our future existence is going to be not only an eternal existence, but it's going to be a royal existence. We're guaranteed that it's going to be wonderful. We are going to have to be heirs to the kingdom. Now, adversity comes to rich and poor alike. Whether you've got $15 in your pocket, whether you've got $15,000 in the bank, or whether you've got $1.5 million in investments, everyone's going to have heartaches in life. Everybody's going to have problems in life. You're not immune. You're not exempt. And we need to be aware that if we continue to live for the Lord, we have something that really is eternal, true riches in heaven. I was, uh, saw an ad on television. It was a travel ad. It was pretty good. There was a guy, and he said, uh, I'm going to try to say it like he said it because it, it had the right voice. He says, uh, 
No one's ever come to the end of their life and been regretted the things they did not buy, but the places they didn't go. I thought, that's a pretty good ad. Nobody ever comes to their end of their life and regrets, hey, I wish I'd have bought that thing. And I, and I realized that, you know, some people make them to the end of their life, and they think, well, I wish I'd have taken that trip. I would have gone to this particular place. But, but you know, as more I thought about that ad, I thought, let me turn the notch up. Let me turn, turn the volume up on that a little bit and say this. No one comes to the end of their life and regrets the things they didn't buy. And even if they regret the places they didn't go, even worse is to come to the end of your life and regret the place you're not going. We need to be aware that God's will for our lives is to be eternally prosperous and eternally rich. Jesus tells us that we need to be rich toward God. Evaluate your life right now by spiritual standards and not dollars and cent standards. A great preacher once said, if you want to figure out how rich you are, Add up everything that you have that money cannot buy and death cannot take away. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're at ease or whether you're pressured, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No matter what your financial position is, no matter what your race is, no matter what your education is, no matter your beauty, no matter your strength, whether you might be here today and you're old, you're an old person or you're a little child. If you don't have Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of your heart, you are a broken debtor and you are only an heir to death sin and hell but let me tell you the good news jesus said he said for what should a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul but if you're poor you can die rich and if you're rich here you don't have to be poor over there believe on christ and trust your life to the lord jesus christ and no matter who you are everyone will go from rags to riches The entire point of what I've said over the last 30 minutes is to bring us to this moment right here. Is to prepare you to hear what I'm about to say. Is that what you need to do right now, if you've never done so, is to come to the place in your life where you trust Jesus Christ. Where you've trusted him and trust him only. That your status is not defined by anything but who you are in Jesus And if you've never received Christ, if you've never asked him to come into your heart, into your life, and to save you, if he's not the king sitting on the throne of your heart this morning, I want to invite you to put him there and receive him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, I'm going to say a prayer. And in this prayer, this isn't isn't some kind of magic formula. There's nothing magical about these words. The Bible says if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, You trust him, we'll be saved. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Without anyone looking around, I want you to, if you've never prayed to receive Christ, I want you to pray in your heart, meaning these words along with me. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I look at my life and I see all the brokenness, all the sin, all the guilt in my life. Lord, I lay it down before you. I lay it before the cross. I'm not worthy, but you are. And you died in my place on the cross. I believe it. Lord, I believe that you died and were buried. And I believe on that third day that you rose again to guarantee me life. I commit my life to you. I turn from sin and self and turn to you. Lord, save me by your grace and by your mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I want to encourage you that you would make it public. The Bible says that who is ashamed, whoever is ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of my father. And I'm just going to ask as everyone stands to your feet this morning, I'm going to be standing down here at the front. 
that you'd come, that you'd give your life to Jesus, that you'd just say, I, I prayed that prayer, I received it. You just come, you take me by the hand, said, but I gave my life to Christ. So there'll be some invitation counselors. So they're going to make their way down here, down at the front. You make it public on this. You step out and come as we sing on this first verse. Also, maybe some of you here this morning and you're discouraged believers. I want to encourage you to remember who you are in Christ. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what the temptations or the pressure that you're facing today, that know that on the other side of the cross that you must carry here, there's a crown you're going to wear over there. Maybe you need to kneel in this altar and ask God to help you to carry that cross, to keep your eyes on the crown. Whether you need to be saved, whether you need to give something to the Lord in prayer, whether you need to unite with our church, you come this morning as we sing.